is this weekend's anchor verse. It's found in Psalms 24, one. It says the Lord, or sorry, the earth is the Lord's, it's on the screen, and everything in it, how much? Everything. everything. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all of its people belong to him. For our final week of Challenge Accepted, the title of today's sermon, if you're taking down notes, is Ready, Willing, and Open-Handed. Ready, Willing, and Open-Handed. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence today. We are ready, we are willing, we wanna live as people that are open-handed with our time, our talent, our resources. The reality is it all belongs to you, God. So give us ears to hear you and mind to understand a heart ready to receive in Jesus' name, amen. It's on the screens, ready, willing, and open-handed. Because you know, in our humanity, a lot of times we live lives like, we live our lives like this. We, li we live like this, close to best, right? And the reality is if we don't release what's in our hands, or we hide in a corner, and we hide our lights, we hide our gifts, our talents, and we don't step into God's purpose with great faith, we don't release what's in our hands. It's very difficult for God to release what's in his. So I'm gonna come out of the gate kind of strong here. I need you to hear this. Our possessions, say my possessions, my skills and talents, my time, even my own life are gifts from God. How many of y'all be believe that? It's all gifts from God. And maybe you did or didn't understand or know that we are all called, this is Bible, we're all called to be good stewards of the gifts God has given us. Now the word stewardship is a little bit of a churchy word. For all you seasoned saints, you're gonna like it. It's on, it's on the uh, screens. The definition of the word stewardship is using God-given abilities to manage God-given resources to accomplish God-ordained results. Stewardship is ultimately an act of, it's, it's an act of placing items of value in a place where it will grow best. Some of y'all instantly checked out. You're like, he's saying words like stewardship. I don't know. I thought this was gonna be something different. I wish you to lock in this weekend because I believe this word is going to help us. and It's gonna unlock an insight to what God is asking of us as his kids. I wanna look at some areas of our lives that we are called to be good stewards in. This includes our time, our talent, and our resources because God's entrusted us to be good stewards of everything that he's given us. They're all gifts from God. So this weekend, we're going to look at how Jesus and others talked about generosity and stewardship all throughout the word. Now, we have a church of thousands. Thousands of people gather across our four campuses. Katie Woodlands here at West Houston, Tanzania. We have thousands of people. That's why we love our groups, because our church is large enough to serve a city, to be a church from neighborhoods to nations. But we're small enough to know each other in groups and serving together but thousands of people call Hope City home. And there's some statistics that are a little sobering and a little bit startling across the Americanized church. And honestly, Hope City is pretty similar in the stats. They say that five to 10% of people that actively call a church home, five to 10, only five to 10% of people actually serve. Some of y'all are like, well, if I do the math and we have thousands of people, that's still a lot of people. I get it, but there's still work to be done, amen. And there's still room for you. And if you're sitting on the sidelines wondering if there's room for you, the answer is yes. Only five to 10%. Only around 10%, the stats are actually eight to 10%, actually are involved in some sort of missions initiative. So we have Days of Hope. I'm gonna do this plug all weekend long. Days of Hope, hopecity.com slash Days of Hope. Last year, we did one week of our Days of Hope. This year, the entire month, we have serve initiatives so that you can look at your calendar, move things around your vacation and staycation, and say, let's go serve at this, let's go be a part of this, let's take our kids to this. There's all kinds of opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But they say only eight to 10% of people actually serve, and only 20% of people that attend church, that call church home, actively participate in tithing and generosity at their local church. That's a sobering thought because think about it for a second. What could we do if all of us jumped in and followed the leading of the Holy Spirit to do what he's asked us to do? There would be almost no limits. We could reach our community and our city in a way bigger way. So here's the truth. 
A lot of times we fall into a few mindsets, and I'm gonna talk about this this morning, a few mindsets that say, but what, what can my gifts and what a little bit of what I can give, how can it make any kind of tangible difference? I've said this, I'm gonna echo it a few times today. We can't all do everything, but we can all do something. And your yes matters. Your yes changes lives. But first, we have to acknowledge this first mindset. Because the truth is, we have to have a shift in a mindset from the posture that says, I get it, Pastor Daniel. This is all mine. I call that person a holy hoarder. <laughs> this is all mine. So I've got four kids, 14, 12, 7, and 4. Fox is four. And Fox Blocks, man, right now, if anything, if he has anything, I'm like, what you have in your hand? Let me have that. He's like, he's mine. I'm like, it's not your, boy, I bought that for you. <laughs> Clothes you're wearing, the bed you're sleeping in. All. We have this mind, this is mine sort of mindset. We have to shift it from this is mine sort of mindset to this all belongs to you, God, mindset. To how would you like me to take care of what belongs to you, Lord, sort of mindset. Because our role as children of God is to faithfully manage and administer God's resources knowing that we ultimately are accountable to him. So there's two things statistically people do not like to be told what to do with. The first one, you can guess it, is your money. You're like, unless you're Dave Ramsey's, you got some sort of snowball method, I don't wanna hear it, right? We don't wanna be told what to do with our money. The second one, and this has nothing to do with my message, but I think it's fun, is nobody wants to be told what to do with their uh, parenting. Like, don't you tell me how to raise my own kids. I love when somebody who doesn't have kids and you know they're 20 or 21, they're like sick, trying to give my wife advice and she's like, oh, have you ever made people? <laughs> I've made my own people. It's wild. And they call me their leader. It's weird, but okay, thanks for your advice, but no thanks, amen. So I feel like the Lord lets me be a part of moments in life to have stories to tell you. So I have actually two stories today. Uh, one is going to be based in the beautiful environment of H-E-B, and then I have another one found in Kroger. So H-E-B, I went the other day um, to pick up something. And so I'm at, I, I'm at, okay, I'm gonna let you in on a couple. I'm gonna give you some pearls today. So I have fallen in love with a beverage called Olipops. If you've never heard of them, it will change your life. They're like a healthy soda. Like they have like stevia instead of all the bad stuff in it. And, uh, but they also have pre and probiotics, so don't drink too many of them or it'll provoke a full body cleanse. Like, you drink two of them, you're like, I don't think I can go anywhere. I think I should probably stay close to dumb and dumber type moments. Okay, so, but I'm trying to find Olipops. Jackie sends me on a mission, find these Olipops. Like, they've got so many, like, like Dreamsicle and Vintage Cola. They're, y'all, I'm telling you, they're next level. And so, but they're healthier. They're not filled with yellow number six and red 40 and high fructose corn syrup. Like, you guys drink, like. So I'm in the soda aisle where they're definitely not because they're over in the bougie, healthy area, $45 a can. It's not true, that's not true. But they're over there. So I'm in the soda aisle, and I see this dad who is way in over his head. Mom's not there. He has three of his kids there, and they're stacking. I mean, like, like they're on a shopping spree at Costco. They're stacking case after case of soda in this cart, and I'm like, I'm gonna watch this happen. And the dad's like, I think that's enough. How many did mom tell us to get? And they're like, is this an enough, dad? And he's like, well, how many do y'all drink a day? How many does your mom let you drink a day? And they're like, Psh, like, they're looking at each other like, confirm the story. Uh, like three a day? Like three? And in real time, the dad is puzzled. He's like, three a day? That seems like a lot. You're seven. Like, <laughs> Three cans. So I'm over here looking at you know Mountain Dew. I'm never gonna buy that. Mountain Dew. I'm over here watching, and this lady, and y'all can't make this up. It's a true story. Lady walks through. I don't know if she was British or Scottish, but she had a phenomenal accent. And she's walking by, and she overhears what I hear. We can drink three a day, Dad. And she turns and says, "She so like a mouthful of cavities, don't you?" I'm like, this is unbelievable. I love this. And I'm like, just, oh, I'm here for this. And the dad's looking at her like, whoa. And he's like, excuse me, ma'am. Can you mind your own business? She said, I was until your son starts talking about three cans a day. That your teeth that just fall right out of your mouth like chiclets. Like, this is unbelievable. 
And he's like, come on, kids, let's get away from this lady. So I'm like, wow, we don't like to be told what to do with our parenting, right? Y'all, same H-E-B, I walk around the corner, they're passing out samples. Some of y'all, how many of y'all are into the samples? Like, some of y'all check your watch because you head to Costco after church. That is your golden corral. You just hit sample station. You change disguises. and Like, fish sticks, what are these? Oh, putting them in your pockets. And so, so they're passing out samples, but y'all, not like a little sample, like full slices of lunch meat. I'm like, this is shocking. There are people lined up in single file line like they're at Universal Studios for this thick cut boar's head turkey. And I'm like, this is shocking. So they hand this lady, this lady hands this mom a, a piece of turkey and the mom begins to drop it in like slow motion. I watch it and it slaps the floor. You heard like, Psh! slaps the floor and every piece of that turkey is touching the floor. I'm like, Whew, I wanted to just kick it under the freezer. The mom says, no, 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 it's okay. And the lady said, let me get you another piece. She's like, it's okay. She reaches down. She starts flipping this thing around. And I'm like, huh? Mm -mm. So now I'm buttoning in, like, ma'am, oh, I don't know. I don't know if you should. I'm not sure. The kids are losing it. I want turkey! Like, they're losing it. I'm like, this is unbelievable. And I'm now stepping in saying, are you sure? And she looks at me like, I will cut you. <laughs> cut you. She, <sighs> now I don't know how you were raised. Some have a five second rule. If you're country, it's five to 10 minute rule. But in a, in a grocery store, <laughs> slapped every part of that turkey's on that floor. She hands it to the kid. The little girl rolls it up, makes eye contact with me and eats it. <laughs> mm -mm. We don't want to be told what to do with our kids that has nothing to do with my message. I just wanted to deliver some fun story to you. So number one, don't tell me about my money. Number two, don't tell me about my kids. For week four of Challenge Accepted, I want to tie previous weekends together where we looked at your time. We're called to be good stewards of our time. You should join a group, lead a group, be a part of what God's doing. Your talent, your gifting, go through growth track. Take the next step to not just attend and to be a consumer only, but to be, own, be an owner and participate and be a part of what God's doing. And then this weekend, I wanna talk about how generosity starts in your heart. Shout out loud, it all starts in my heart. Come on, I need you to grab that. <laughs> starts in my heart. So again, week one, we talked about staying connected. Week two, getting off the sidelines. And this weekend, I wanna talk about a heart of generosity. Now, there's a misconception that I want to clear up because maybe you were raised in a churchy church environment. Maybe you have some church hurt around this. Maybe you're sitting there like, I knew it. Every pastor at some point is going to talk about money. I thought that I timed it to miss that weekend. Now I'm stuck in between 90 people. I can't just get up. Everybody will notice me leaving. <laughs> now, there's this misconception because I grew up post my dad dealing drugs and hustling and coming home with lots of cash because he was out selling and doing crazy stuff. I went from that to being in a church where, you know, they, Pastor Brandon's three-minute moment up here was special, but man, I've been in church where they take 45-minute offerings. And they're like, I feel like there's six of you gonna give a thousand. You're like, my God, I thought the thousand section was over there. You switched it up on me. I thought I was in the $2 zone, Amen. But if you grew up in churchy church, you might have a mindset that God's trying to get something from you. But it's the opposite. He's not trying to get something from you. God's actually trying to get something to you. So ultimately, he can pass it through you. Because it's not about being coerced or convinced to do it. It starts in your heart. Now, all of us know stories and have stories. I talked to a guy who said, man, my grandma in the middle of the night couldn't sleep and turn on a televangelist and the guy convinced her to give money to get her miracle. She wired him $10,000, Pastor Daniel. And there are moments where people have manipulated and twisted and used money as a tool to try to get people convinced to do something that was against what they were hoping to do. But here's what 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 says, because again, it's in the heart. Let each one thoughtfully and with purpose, I love that, just as he's decided in his heart or her heart, not grudgingly, under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one whose heart is in the gift. Another translation says connected to the gift because being generous and living a life of generosity 
actually aligns our hearts to the heart of God. Because God's heart has always been and will always be about people. That's why we do this. We love God, we love people. From neighborhoods to nations, we're doing our best to get in the way of people's storms. How many of y'all are, are here this weekend because somebody invited you to, to show up to church? Nobody, we gotta do better. Okay, All right, a handful of people. Okay, some of y'all are like, I found it on MySpace. I don't know, I just, it was a flyer in a parking lot. That's how I ended up here. Okay, great. No, people matter to God, so they matter to us. And God's heart has always been about people. And as we grasp the depth of God's love and his grace ourselves, it empowers us and compels us to share that blessing with others. His generosity is a tangible expression of God's love and compassion for others. 2 Corinthians 9, 11 says, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be, I love this, generous on every occasion. Through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So H-E-B, now let's shift gears and let's drive over to Kroger. I told you I was giving you pearls. Here's another product that my family has uh, man, been committed to for about a year and a half now. It's a brand called Almond Breeze. It's an almond milk that they blend real bananas in. I'm telling you, there's manna in there. There's a little touch of the Lord's anointing. And my son and my wife love it, and I'm not gonna tell you which Kroger I go to because I buy all of them when they put it on the shelf. If there's six, I'm gonna buy them. If there's eight, I'm picking them up. So I took my daughter Finley to Kroger because we needed banana milk, and there's only this one Kroger I can go to. So I went, and we're standing in self-checkout, and I hear beep, beep, beep. I mean, like, beep. I'm like rapid fire, beep. I'm like, this is unbelievable. Who is this? And I look behind me, and there's that one lady. You know who I'm talking about? Who's the coupon lady? She had a stack of coupons like this in a, in a folder. I was just like, I don't need 47 cans of Chef Boardee, but I do today because I have a coupon for it. Where's all the couponers at? Come on. Y'all, I don't, I'd love to learn your life less. I don't know how to, that's too much work. So anyways, beep, 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 beep. That's pretty good. <laughs> what a bad person. And I hear the Lord through the beep, say, I want, you to, I want you to pay for what's left. I want you to bless them. And I look over, you know, she, she has a lot of stuff. <laughs> and I thought I missed it because the guy over here had a little, little tiny little personal <laughs> size croissant container. I said, God, I, I feel compelled to bless him. <laughs> Beep. <laughs> Beep. <laughs> Beep. Maybe I didn't hear you through the the beep, because this guy, he's just, he's fumbling around trying to, look at him, God, he's in distress. He can't even find his wallet for the $3.86 for this croissant. And I hear the Lord, so I walk over and awkwardly, these moments are always a little awkward. And I said, excuse me. And as I'm trying to get their attention, she's trying to put her card in the machine and I push her arm away. That's assault. <laughs> you can't. I'm off the rails now. I'm missing God over the croissant thing. I'm, she's like, excuse me. I said, I'm sorry. That, and I just put my card in. I was like, this one's on me. And she's like, what? And I pay for it. And I pull my card out. And the guy looks at me and goes, you really love people. And I said, I do. I didn't realize I was wearing my love people hat that we sell. <laughs> I thought he was a prophet. I was like... Sir, I do love people. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. This is a true story. And, and he says, who told you to do this? Who told you to come over here? And I said, the, the, Lord, the Lord did, man. I said, I just felt like I was supposed to come over here. I don't need to make a big deal about it. I just want to bless you. But what I didn't know, y'all, she had over $90 in coupons. It only cost me $13. Way, yeah. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. Like it was a whole moment. Now I could have gone over before she finished all the coupons, but the Lord did not lead me until the very end. And this is what she said. She said, Man, you touched you touched our, our heart. People don't do things like this anymore. She said, We try to be a blessing where we can came, but we're on a fixed income, and we're struggling real bad, and they were older, and he had a lot of health problems, and 
And they were just so overwhelmed with emotion. And Finley and I walked down, she smiled, and she said, Dad, that was awesome. And she was so filled up, and we were refreshed, and we got in the truck, and, and I didn't know. She was like, Dad, the guy was running out to my truck, and I almost hit him, like, boom, boom. Like, that wouldn't have been a blessing. Like, the whole moment inside, like, you really love people, boom, boom, and I run over him. It's not a blessing. And he's like, roll your window down. I was like, okay. And he said, do you believe in prayer? And I said, I do. He said, I, I don't ever do this. I felt like you're supposed to pray for me. So he's standing outside, and we, for 30 minutes, talk about what's going on in their lives. And Finley and I have an opportunity. We thought we went to Kroger on an assignment to get banana milk, because Jackie would have said, don't you come home without it. You know what I mean? Like, you better come back with banana milk. But we thought we went there for banana milk, but we went to bless somebody with $13.76 in groceries and ultimately able to lay hands on my friend Terry, Miss Catherine, and say, God, I thank you for the miraculous that's gonna touch him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. God loves people. And the heart of generosity says, I'll get in the way. And I will be generous with my time, my gifting, and my resources if you ask me to. Because here's the truth. When you freely give without expecting anything in return, I wasn't expecting anything in return. We mirror the selfless love that God has shown us. The Bible reminds us in 1 John 4, 11, dear friends, since God loved us this much, we surely ought to love each other. Through moments of generosity, we extend a helping hand. That's what this whole moment next month is gonna be about with Days of Hope. We extend a helping hand to those in need. We provide hope and compassion and support to those who are in a low place. Generosity becomes a testimony to God's loving work through us. And in the words of my new friend Kathleen, she said, you touched our hearts. It touches hearts. It inspires others. She said, after I prayed, she said, we don't have a lot, but you inspired us to do something for somebody today. I said, awesome. Pass it on. Pass on the love and the compassion of Christ because what ends up happening when you pour out, God fills you up and you leave yourself filled up and refreshed. It's not my opinion. It's Bible. Proverbs eleven twenty five. The generous will prosper those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Jesus says in Acts 20, 35, hey, it's better to give than it is to receive. Because he understood when you, ref when you send out and you bless others and you pour out, you will leave refreshed and filled up yourself. When it comes to our resources, our time, our talent, our resources that he's given us and we live as generous people, it allows us to see God's blessings all around us. I said last week, the enemy can't take you out, so he's gonna try to wear you out. How many of y'all feel just lately like there's been even more spiritual warfare happening? Like you just feel like he's just trying to wear you out. It's the devil's working overtime because he knows the church of God is the most dangerous entity on the planet to the work of the enemy. So don't allow the enemy to get in your head and try to dis distract you from seeing all the blessings around you. You woke up again today. You're standing again today. You're breathing again today. God has a purpose on your life today. Don't miss the opportunity. God's been so generous to us. I was telling Jackie the other day, I said, even when we were in a low, low, low place financially, and we barely knew how to make it, God was still so generous to us. By the show of hands across every campus, how many would say, God has been so generous to me? He's been so kind to me. That's what the Bible says in James 1.17. Every good thing, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, the creator, the sustainer of the heavens, in whom there is no variation, no rising or setting, or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and he never changes. Generosity, the heart of generosity, starts in the heart. It's God planting this seed in your heart that says, hey, I want you to step out. Now we think step of faith, to take a step of faith, like Pastor Daniel, man, challenge accepted, like I'm ready. I'm gonna go tip my waiter or waitress today 12%. I normally only do six, but I'm gonna do 12. 
these big steps of faith, these big audacious leaps of faith. How many of y'all have ever heard the saying, like, take a leap of faith, brother? It's like, my God, I don't know how to take a leap of faith. I barely can do a mustard seed step of faith. But check this out. That little step is a step of faith. That little step that says I'm willing is a step of faith. That little step that says yes to whatever God you have today for my life so that I'm not caught in the me, myself, and I sort of posture, but instead I see a there you are, not here I am sort of mindset. That little step of faith can change everything because generosity starts in your heart. Watch this, not in your bank account. It starts in your heart, not in your bank account. If you're waiting on a specific amount to be in your bank account before you can be generous, you don't quite have the heart of generosity just yet. Because I'll, I'll be honest, in my humanity, uh, I wanted to send uh, Finley over as a spy to see how much it was going to be. <laughs> just sneak over, bump into the guy, peek, and just walk back over here. Just peek at the screen and come back over and tell me how much it's going to be. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the generosity doesn't start in your bank account. It starts in your heart. And this is key. God does not bless giving. What? No, he blesses the heart behind giving. Because newsflash, God, God has... He's the creator of everything. He doesn't need our money. He wants our hearts. And he wants us to trust him, to put him first in every area of our lives so that we can ultimately, through obedience and faithfulness, make room for the blessings and favor that he wants to pour out on us. Shout out loud, it starts in the heart. Come on, it starts in my heart. And our goal all throughout this series, all the takeaways, all the challenge accepted moments, is for all of us to identify what's holding us back. And our prayer this weekend is that if you can't take a leap of faith, that you just take a step of faith. It starts somewhere. Because again, we can't all do everything, but we can all do something. He's looking for willing hearts who are ready, living open-handed. This is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 10. It's on the screen. For God is the one, I love this verse, who provides seed for the farmer, that's great, and the bread to eat. So he's not only blessing you with the ability to plant, He's also taking care of your needs. In the same way, he will provide increase. He will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. I wrote in the margin of my notes, in me and through me. Because every farmer gets to keep a little seed himself, but open-handed, you're able to be a blessing and then you can be a blessing to others. Generosity actually is tied to our time. It's tied to our talent. It's tied to our purpose. I love how the Amplified talks and describes our gifts and our purposes. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, for he does not withdraw what he has given, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace to or to whom he sends his call. He's placed specific gifts, a specific call, a unique set of skills in every single one of us. And it's super important to grab this. God did not give you anything that he intended for you to waste. We can leave right there. We can just be done. Like, and goodbye. He did not give you anything he intended for you to waste. So if he gave you the ability, he's also supplying you with the capability to fulfill that call. And I've preached this before, but I think it's a good reminder this weekend that underutilized or untapped ability is simply potential. And potential and purpose actually run parallel. The foundation of our ability and capability comes from God alone. But this is the key. If you don't recognize your potential, you'll never fully walk in your purpose. You've got potential, baby. There's things that God wants to do through you. But you have to recognize, am I just stalled out? Am I stuck in a rut? My grandma used to say that to me. She'd say, you have potential, baby. There's nobody like you. She said, nobody, there's nobody like you on this planet. Sure, there's people that look a little bit like you. You got stunt doubles running around. There's nobody like you, baby. God has purpose and potential, and he wants to unlock it. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for your willingness to step out of your comfort zone. That's why what we do with our time, our talent, our resources is essential for us to truly become who we're called to be. It's our choice, though. Watch this to remain faithful and obedient and willing during the journey where he's doing the equipping and unlocking. For me, I remain faithful to God because he's been so faithful and so kind 
to me. I'm grateful for the times. I told Jackie, I said, I'm really, really grateful for the times that he messed up our plans so our plans didn't mess us up. How many of y'all are grateful for the times that he messed up your plans so that your plans didn't mess you up? Some of y'all are thinking of a relationship. You're like, yes, Lord, amen. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised, that's him, is faithful. God doesn't change, people do. God doesn't lie, other people do. But he's faithful and remains consistent. The Bible is full of accounts of God's faithfulness and his consistency to his people. I've preached about multiple times this year, but Genesis, 1, 20, or Genesis 21, he approaches Abraham and Sarah and says, I'm gonna give you a, a baby. You're gonna name him Isaac. In your old age, some of y'all are like, that is not my verse. That is not my word for the, for the year. In Exodus 14, he saved the Israelites from the Egyptians. In Daniel 6, he delivered Daniel from the mouths of the lion. God's faithfulness was never more astounding than when he delivered us from the very grips of sin and he gave us a way out to join him in heaven through Jesus. Come on, somebody should shout, my God is faithful. Come on. So God's been faithful to us but what does it say about us being faithful to God? Because being faithful to God is different than his faithfulness to us. When God is faithful to us, he cares for us, he leads us, he protects and provides for us because he loves us. When we're faithful to him, we trust that he will take care of us, we follow where he leads us, and we take care of and we're good stewards of what he's entrusted us with, with our resources, our time, our talent, our treasure, because we ultimately love him. Being faithful also means that there should be some sort of faith evident in God. We preached a series called The Evidence, that if you walk with the Lord and there's fruit, there should be some sort of evidence. 1 Corinthians 2.5 says, so that your faith will not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. When you're a Christian, again, walking in relationship, a Christian means Christ-like, you will produce fruit. We talked about it earlier this year that there should be some sort of fruit everywhere you go. Somebody should tell, man, something different about her. Something different about him. John 15, five, if you've been around Hope City, you know I love this verse. It says, I'm the vine, that's God. You're the branches, that's us. Those who live in me while I live in them will produce a lot of fruit, but you can't produce anything without me. I don't care how, how much of a drive and hustle you have, the favor of God will get you into rooms that hustling can't get you into. The favor of God on your life, one day of favor in his presence. Yeah, but I bet on me, because everybody else has always messed me over. The faithfulness of God, you can't produce anything without him. Now you'll have some victories, you'll have some moments. The goal is to stay connected to the vine, and this is what fruit looks like, Galatians 5, and 23. The fruit of the spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, forbearance. It's kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's good. That's really great, Pastor Daniel. Thank you for the big picture of fruit. How do we practically look at this in our lives? When you're faithful to your word, your fruit is, your reputation is, you're an honest person. When you're faithful in character and you're faithful in integrity, there are blessings that follow because these are all attributes of the heart of God. I've said this before, God wants to bless you. He wants to pour out his spirit on your life. You can't stop his blessings, but you can block his blessings. We have to stay connected to the vine. Now, let me say this with all sincerity, because we all have stuff. Come on, wave at me if you've got some stuff. Come on, some compartmentalized things. Some of you are like, are we talking about stuff like a boat? Or like, no, we all have things in our lives, and God's not looking for perfection. It does not mean that we won't struggle or miss moments where we choose our own path because it's more comfortable instead of listening to his voice. But what it does mean is that we continue to trust him and follow his leading even when life gets difficult. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. This part right here is gonna be super freeing to somebody. God knows your abilities. He knows all of our abilities and capabilities. And he knows that we're not all given the same gifts, same talents, and same opportunities. Some of y'all are like, I know that because I can hear Kim singing up here and it's amazing. The person next to me could not sing on key. And it's okay. God loves your worship, amen. But I love this, this is freeing. He doesn't expect the same results from all of us. That's so good. He's equipped and created us to be who we are called to be. Come on, somebody say out loud, I'm chosen by God. I'm telling you, Genesis 1:27 says you're shaped 
and molded in his image, you have been handpicked by God. Some of you are living a life that feels unfulfilled because you've been so concerned and caught up in the trap of comparison. You're always thinking, man, everybody else seems to be doing so much better than me. I've had those thoughts. How many of y'all have ever had those thoughts? This part right here I pray is freeing to you. You won't get caught in the trap of comparison if you're captivated by purpose. What is God equipping you to step out in? Because to me, myself, and I trap is real. The trap of comparison will rob you of your joy. It'll rob you of your strength. It'll rob you of your tenacity and your drive and your determination and your confidence. If you're captivated by purpose, man, I, I love championing other people. I, I love celebrating other people's wins. Some of y'all need to learn to celebrate when it's not your time yet. Celebrate and cheer other people on. Some of y'all are like, I didn't catch that. I don't want to do that. That is not my challenge accepted. <laughs> no, but the truth is, some of you may be saying, well, Daniel, here's the reality. I, I would just make a little ripple right now. You don't know the place I'm in right now. I can't make a big splash. I don't even know what kind of impact I would make. Even giving, serving, giving money. I, I don't know how I would make an impact at all. Zechariah 4.10 says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. It's that little step of faith. So I want to encourage you throughout this Challenge Accepted series, I want to encourage you as we wrap it up to start somewhere. Jump in a group. Go through growth track. Become part of the Dream Team family. Be faithful in your resources, even if it's mustard seed. Even if it's the widow's might. Be faithful to the principles of what God is asking you to do. Because what is God asking you to step out in faith to do? Maybe it's a mission trip. Maybe every time Pastor Brandon starts talking about prison mission trips, you're like, I'm gonna do it. And then you walk right by the blue tent and you leave. What is God asking of you? Maybe you wanna sow and you wanna be generous, but you feel like it wouldn't be that much, so you've just been holding on to it. And God's saying, hey, if you'll trust me with that, you'll release what's in your hand, I will bless you with more. Maybe God's asking you to start a business. Maybe you have a dream. Maybe you've been reluctant. I'm telling you, all of it, all of it is enough. Whether you feel like it's little or much, all of it's enough in the hands of God. There was this season, Jackie and I are celebrating 19 years of marriage July 10th. Come on, somebody. It's a big deal. Because statistically in my family, when you like get past year one, it's like, we made it. <laughs> like, so 19 years, so excited. But I remember there was a cycle, a pattern. It was a figure eight. We just couldn't get out of. We wanted to give every time they would do a missions moment or they were trying to take care of something at the church or we wanted the tithe. We had a heart of generosity, but we just didn't know how to follow through on it. Our money didn't make sense. Yet, we found ourselves in a cycle where we bought stuff we could not afford. Those same as cash places. We lived beyond our means. We told ourselves we deserved it. And we were stressed. Super overwhelming stress. Like, just really, really stressed. And I remember we felt like we were stuck in a rut. She's like, babe, I feel like we're stuck in this rut. It felt like a cycle we couldn't get out of while we were sipping a $6 drink of Starbucks. We're like, I know, I love your new shoes. Are those brand new? Like, because we made room for what we wanted. And we were stuck in this pattern. We were stuck in this cycle. We just couldn't get out of it. I went to this, um, this trampoline place with my kids. And I... Uh, I jumped off of this like huge trampoline into the foam pit and I went super deep and I couldn't get out. I thought it was over. I was like, tell Jackie, we've had a good run. Like, <laughs> man, it caused humility to come alive in me. It removed all pride from my life. I lost, I lost a sock and a shoe, never saw it again. Couldn't find my iPhone. <laughs> they drug me out, laid me down on the side. I was like, <sighs> is that normal for people? They're like, no, it's not. I not how that happened. Why are you telling us that? That's what Jackie and I felt like. We felt like we were stuck in a rut we couldn't get out of. So I went to a mentor. I went to a pastor friend of mine. And I said, sir, I, I, I feel like Jackie and I, we, we, we want to give. We have a heart of generosity. But we just don't know where to start. And he said, well, listen, I want you to sit down. Because you're, you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you, okay? You're not going to like hearing what I'm about to tell you. Opened the Bible there. He had a huge, like massive, like King James Version Bible sitting on his coffee table. He said, would you open up to 
Proverbs 1, 7. Like, why are you talking like that? Like, and it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's like, you could have sent me to any other verse. He said, Daniel, you know the word, but you can't get past yourself. You like to stop at Starbucks every day. It's okay. You like the nice furniture. You like having up-to-date clothes. I've never seen you in, a, in the same pair of shoes twice. I said, oh, that's true. I, and this is what he said. This is going to be freeing to somebody because some of y'all are like, I like stuff. I get it. He said, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with having nice things as long as nice things don't have your attention more than God does. And then he dropped a mic. I'm like, why do you have a mic? He said, let me help you. Your time doesn't belong to you. Your talent, your gifts, they don't belong to you. Your money doesn't belong to you. It all belongs to God. And stewardship calls us to employ wisdom, integrity, and diligence in managing God's resources. That moment shifted Jackie and I's perspective and helped us get things in order. And I can say, all these years later now, we've broken the cycle. We're no longer stuck in the foam pit, y'all. We're faithful in our tithe. We're living within the boundaries of a budget. We paid off debt. And now when God says, hey, I want you to take care of that person's groceries, I'm not overwhelmed or panicked because we actually have in our budget now set aside moments of blessings that we are mirroring for our kids to see. We have moments where we say, let's bless that waiter. Who would you like to bless this month? Because we've budgeted it in our budget. But before, we didn't even understand what generosity and stewardship look like. And now we're actually budgeting for it. Because hear this, God will only give you what you can steward. So if you're waiting on perfect timing to start tithing, if you're waiting on the perfect timing to serve, you're waiting on the perfect timing because you're waiting on God to do something new. Pastor Daniel, I'm just waiting on my time. I'm asking him to do something new in my life. Why would God ask something new of you if you haven't done the last thing he told you to do? Think about this. I know it's stepping on somebody's J's today, but think about it. We always wanna just forget all the other moments. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. Because I do think that if I would have skipped the Kroger moment, he would have given me another opportunity. But wow, the part of buying their groceries was not the big part. The part of standing in that parking lot and praying for a miracle and believing God and believing for heaven to touch earth, that was what God sent us on an assignment for. But this is what the Bible says in Luke 16, 10. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Oh, is this okay? Some of you are like, oh, it's hot outside. I mean, I can't go outside. I can't leave the message. It's too hot outside. If you're faithful in little things, <laughs> you'll be faithful in large ones. If you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. So I grew up in churchy church where I thought stewardship was only about money, giving of my resources, but giving money to church or a charity, a mission initiative is not stewardship. It's just a part of stewardship. Okay, so it's not my money. You want my talents. You want my voice, season five voice talent. You want voice season five? No, 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 I just, but I'm just saying, I've got the talent. You want, is that stewardship? No, that's a part of stewardship. It's not stewardship. Because again, what you give or what you do in ministry is a part of stewardship, but it's not encompassing stewardship. How many of y'all give your kids allowance? Real quick, what is stewardship? How many of y'all give your kids allowance? Come on, real quick. Nobody, I love this. <laughs> Because we allow our kids to live in our house. That's like, when my son's like, why are you in my room? I'm like, whoa, whoa, you're in my second master bedroom. Like, I'm letting you stay in there until we move some stuff in there. Like, we, <laughs> I love that. Every service, how many of y'all give your kids allowance? People are like, mm, mm I allow them to eat mac and cheese at my house. But we do have a little bit of money that Jackie and I like to give our kids because we're teaching them some principles. We want them to have some fun, use it wisely. We give it so they can be a blessing to their friends. We give it so they can learn a budget. We give to them because we want them to learn how to build a savings. It's not that much, but it's the principle. But ultimately, we give so that they have a chance to model what Jackie and I have faithfully modeled for them. As soon as we shut the truck door, Finley said, that was amazing. When can I do that? I said, you can do that anytime you want. She said, can we go back in there now? I said, mm-mm, no, not today. Like, 
this was a one and done. Amen. <laughs> because ultimately, stewardship is not just a decision. It's a reflection of God's faithfulness. True stewardship is a commitment to modeling the heart of Jesus with what God has given you. So Jackie and I have been modeling what generosity looks like when we encourage a waiter or a waitress or we bless them a little bit more than what a normal tip would be. We want our kids to see this. Why? Again, because stewardship is not merely a decision. It's a reflection. Some of you have been walking around. I believe this is gonna touch somebody's heart. You've been walking around with giftings your whole life with no idea how to fully use them. Maybe you have a hospitality gift, but you've never known quite where to direct it. Maybe you're a creative You've never found an outlet. Maybe you're a businessman and you've always felt the stress and the pressure of what to do with your resources and your wealth. Maybe you possess these incredible gifts, but you weren't raised up in a family who maybe gave you or pointed you in a direction on how to use your gifts. In my experience, gifting without direction is often a burden. It feels heavy. The weight feels heavy. But gifting with reflection and instruction can be a joy. Because when you're taught how to use what you have, you'll love to give what you've been given. All right, a couple, few takeaways real quick. Number one, write this down. Generosity is connected to the heart. It's what we've been talking about. It's connected directly to your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. It's not what you give. It's not what you do for God. It's the heart behind why you do it. If the money, the resources that you're giving to God, you do with the wrong attitude. It's not stewardship. If you serve, but you're like, man, I can't believe they want me to show up again. It's not stewardship. It's the heart behind stewardship that's everything. We don't have to do this. We get to do this because we're his kids on this earth making a massive difference. Number two, generosity is connected to every season. Whether you're in a super lean season or you have it all figured out, the misconception is, I'll be generous when I have all my ducks in a row. I'll be generous when I have a lot more money. I'll go on that missions trip when I can fit it in my calendar. Statistically, perfect timing never comes because generosity and stewardship is connected to every single season of your life. There's a gentleman who comes to my Bible study, and he said he looked at his wife about two or three, I think it was two or maybe three years ago, and he said, there's something out of order in our lives. She's like, what? It's like we've never tithed. We've never been consistent with giving back what belongs to God. He said, I think we should commit to one year. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll never do it again. So he went home and he said he turned in the Bible to Proverbs 3.9, where it says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. He said, let's commit to this to one year and see what God does. He said, Pastor Daniel, our entire business that was barely surviving exploded. And everything that was in our hearts to give, to serve, to be a part. God flipped our situation around because we aligned our hearts with God's heart and we were willing to follow through on what the word says from old covenant to new covenant and we're gonna be faithful with our tithe. He said, we learned what obedience and stewardship was, what generosity really looked like and we learned that wherever our treasure is, our heart would be also. What I love about that story because I love this couple, if God did it for them, he can do it for you. That's really good news. You can clap because if he did it for them, if he blessed them for their commitment, this is not my opinion. This is the Bible, Acts 10, 34. Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. That's a freeing verse because God will show favor to those who are faithful, not favoritism. We can all walk in the favor of the Lord. If you receive that, say amen. Come on. So here's the question this weekend. Challenge accepted. Can he trust you? Can he trust you with what he has asked you to step out in? Can he trust you to be obedient and follow through when he leads you? Because I know from firsthand experience, obedience isn't always fun, but it is always fruitful. Jackie and I have decided and we've agreed based upon biblical principles that we're gonna tithe. We're gonna be generous. We're gonna serve. I don't just talk about groups, y'all. I lead a group. I lead two groups. We practice what we preach. We're not just saying it to say it. We're saying if you will follow the principles of the Bible, there's nobody more prepared to advise, to advise and shelter you for your future than the one who holds it all in his hands. And I'd rather put the 90% that he's given me, knowing I can put my faith for him to bless it, and put the 10% in his hands. 
my wife and I committed to something. I'm not bragging about this, but we committed about, about two and a half years ago that we were gonna start giving 20%. We we're gonna give 10% tithe, we we're gonna give another 10% in our offering. We started doing it faithfully, didn't know how we were gonna be able to do it. And God always has showed up and he's breathed and he's moved. Supernaturally, there's been moments that we're like, wow, God, you really are fighting for us and moving on our behalf. My prayer this weekend is that you would start somewhere. Because it's easy to hide, it's easy to stay on the sidelines, it's easy to never jump in, it's easy to not go to a group, not lead a group, not serve, not give, just be a consumer only. It's easy to do that. Nobody's forcing you. There's something freeing when you recognize that your purpose is not about you. Your purpose is for others. We have this YOLO, you only live once sort of mindset, but that's a lie, because eternity is a real thing. This entire thing is about eternity. What you do on this planet echoes in eternity. Your time, your talent, your resources make a difference. Would you close your eyes just for a moment? I'm gonna ask you this loaded questions all throughout, but does your time honor Jesus? Does your talents and your gifting honor Jesus? Does your obedience, your resources, your generosity, does it honor Jesus? Does your life reflect and look like Jesus? Some of you are like, Pastor Daniel, I hear you, but the reality is I just, I, I, I don't know, I don't know where to, I don't know how to step out in this yet. All it takes is your yes. Search your heart for just a moment. What is God leading you towards? Because there is a plan. He has a plan. God's plan is not just a Drake song. It's a real assignment he has for you. All right, look up one more time. Number three, generosity is connected to your Yes. You just have to get your yes out of the way. And that yes is a tough decision because it's a stretching decision. And it will stretch you like a rubber band stretches. But the reality is that stretching is not designed to break you. It's designed to catapult you into your future. I love this quote. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Today, you're going to have a generosity card on your way out. It says, note to self, live generous. Live generously. The Bible says in Hebrews 6.10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work. The love you have shown him as you have helped his people, continue to help him. Your challenge, if you choose to accept it, is to live generously. Pay it forward. Do something for somebody else. Start somewhere. Start giving. Show up and serve. Be a part of what God is doing here. Again, our days of hope is something that you can get involved in. If you don't have the financial resources to give, it's an opportunity to serve and show up and show your kids, this is what our mustard seed faith looks like. I love our church because you guys are incredibly generous. We had about 12 kids because we've sold out of our youth camp. It's coming up next month. We had about 12 kids that needed scholarship. I sent out a text to our Bible study. Pastor Oryk sent out a text. We had one guy say, how much is needed? He said, I wanna give this much. Another guy texted and said, hey, how much is left over? And we told him, he said, I'll cover all of it. All 12 kids got scholarship in a matter of about seven minutes because our church is generous. So just ask God, Lord, what would you have me do and simply be obedient, follow through? The word generous is to be liberal in giving, one who lives open-handed. Generous heart and a generous life starts with a revelation from God. And when you have a revelation from God, it fuels a dedication to God. That's why we're dedicated to building at 5300 West Sam Houston Parkway, our new West Houston campus. Come on, somebody. We do it to take territory. We do it to romance people to Jesus. We do it because we believe God is gonna move and thousands of people are gonna be impacted. Not to have a big building to brag about, no, to say this is a place of hope. It's gonna say Hope City Church, find God here. People are gonna be able to walk in. And we believe there are gonna be people that walk up to you in heaven and say thank you for your generosity because you sent that missionary, because you're, you showed up and you went to that mission trip in prison. My brother and my sister are here in heaven with us. Because you built that building, my mom and dad came to know the Lord. This is why we do it. Because we believe that we're a house of miracles and we're passionate about reaching the lost romancing people to God. My challenge to you as a church, I know I've gone long. My challenge as a church this weekend 
as we start the summer off strong is that we would be committed. We'd step out in faith in the area of generosity. That you would search your heart and commit to radical generosity. That you would jump in and be a part. That you would take this card and prayerfully consider how you can jump in and be a part. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, our final verse. And God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. One more time, if you'll close your eyes. God, I pray that our hearts will overflow with gratitude as we embrace our calling to be faithful stewards of everything that you've entrusted and blessed us with, knowing ultimately the end goal is that one day we will hear our Savior's words as written in Matthew 25, verse 23, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You can trust me, Lord. Tell him that. Say, Lord, you can trust me. You can trust me. I get my yes out of the way. Generosity is connected to the heart. Generosity is connected to every season. It's connected to your yes. With every eye closed just for a moment, if you're here, the reason we do all of this is because people matter to God again, so they matter to us. And I'm gonna give two invitations. The foundation of all of this, everything we've been talking about through the entire Challenge Accepted series, the answer begins with and ends with Jesus. The reason we do all of this is because of Jesus. So if you're here today and you would say, Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to. That's the first invitation. I want to give my life to Jesus for the very first time. We don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons, but according to Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Slate wiped clean, sins is thrown as far from the east as the west. He's writing victory in your story. Or maybe the second invitation, you would say, Daniel, here's the truth. I've walked with him, but I got selfish. I got caught up in the me, myself, and I trap. I got caught up in the prodigal life and I've been going my own way. I've been trying to follow my own path and I want to fall back in the arms of God today and rededicate my life. I'm going to count to three. We will not embarrass you, but I want you with boldness to lift up your hand on three and say, you're talking about me. One, I want to give my life to Jesus. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I see you. One, two, three, four, five. I see you six and seven and eight. I see you nine. I see you 10. I see you 11 and 12 and 13. I see hands all the way in the back, 14 and 15. Come on, somebody. I saw my friend right here in the middle. I see you, buddy. I see you all the way back. You can put your hands down. Can we make some noise for everybody who said, today's my day? And if you're watching online, just say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. If you're in additional seating, say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. We're about to pray a prayer. I want everybody to say this prayer. Nobody leaving just yet. Say this out loud. Say, Jesus, it's me. Thank you for your generosity by providing Jesus to hang on the cross, to pay the tab in full for all my sins and struggles. I repent for all my issues and I ask for forgiveness. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for redeeming me. You're my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we make some noise for everybody who just said yes to Jesus? Let's go.